Gospel of John. So if you're not there, go ahead and open your Bibles or pull out the old cell phone technology. Get in there and jump into whatever version you're comfortable with. Um, we are going to be reading out of the New King James Version. So if my verbiage doesn't exactly line up with yours, the message is still at its core the same thing. So a little bit of a background story. John, the Apostle John, the one whom Jesus loved, or the one whom loved Jesus. So this is a great place to start. I think I heard Pastor Nick mention this a few weeks ago when I was still praying about my message. And after Pastor Stephen's wonderful message last week about the worth and the value that we were bought and paid for by Jesus, you know, the Gospel of John is a great place to start if you are a new believer or if you are preaching the Gospel to somebody who is either unfamiliar or kind of new to the whole Gospel message. The way it begins talks about Jesus being part of the creation as well, and where the other Gospels will start differently. I'll get there in a moment. But if you find yourself in a position where you're speaking with somebody who's new to the faith, who may have some questions, the Gospel of John is a wonderful, wonderful place to start. And then I would recommend just following that up with Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, which is the formation of the church as we know it today, and all that went with that. So if you're ever in a position, this is a great, great place to start if you don't know where to go. Um, the Gospel of John was one of the last Gospels that was written. It was written around the first century. Um, it was, uh, John wrote it for the purpose of convincing people that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, or as the Hebrews say, Mashiach, like he is that. And so there's a lot of what we see later in the epistles of Paul. There's a lot of old doctrine and old beliefs and even other religions trying to force their way into what the church that Jesus had created through Peter and everybody else. So there's a lot of false doctrine floating around, a lot of things that are trying to water down or take away from the message. And so John was addressing this as well, and he was kind of starting at the beginning to let people know, hey, here's what we believe, but let's, before we get into that, let's just start from the start. And that's the beauty of this gospel message. And so... John declares his purpose for writing these books, and um, it's, a, it's awesome. And so speaking of books, um, I brought this with me today. I'm going to read it uh, page for page, line for line, so get comfortable. <laughs> We're going to be here for a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. This was a gift. Pastor Nick brought this uh, to me after going home. Uh, I believe it was for your father's funeral, I believe. You went home, and uh, he went home to bury his father, and he came back with this three-book series from his pastor, his church. And this has been an invaluable resource to me. And um, as I was reading and preparing for my message, I kind of jumped in here. And there were some wonderful, wonderful things uh, that were mentioned in here. And I'm just going to read a couple of things to you. And then we're going to get into the scripture and I'm going to jump into my message. So let me get there really quickly. I've been jumping in this so much, I, for, I lost my place, but it's right here. Everybody's waiting patiently. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. <laughs> So, it says, This was the message of the one who was mending nets, the one that was trying to keep believers from fragmenting and splitting, John. John was a man whose message was love. But it's important to understand that John did not speak from a lofty theological perch, far from moved from real life. You see, all of Jesus' original disciples died violently, brutal deaths, except for John. But it was not for a lack of trying, <laughs> the Roman Emperor Domitian ordered John to be put into a cauldron of boiling oil. But when that failed to kill him, he was exiled to a rocky, seemingly God-forsaken island called Patmos, where he received the Book of Revelation. And following his release from the exile in Patmos, probably nearing 100 years of age, John returned to Asia Minor, where he went from church to church, sometimes carried on a stretcher. And the historian Eusebius tells us that when John would come into the meeting places, People would break out into applause, for this is the one who knew Jesus. And they would say, tell us something heavy, tell us something heavy. But John would deliver a single sentence sermon. And he would say, and this has been the theme since prayer this morning. This is why I mentioned this again. Children love one another. That's it. <laughs> Ow. Carried him in on a stretcher. Everybody, oh, everybody's crazy, going crazy for John. Love one another. Adios. <laughs> That's it. Beautiful. And from the church to church, John traveled with this single message, children 
love one another. It's beautiful. Now, last one. And I start. Yet, along with his faults, John did possess one sterling quality. For one, for of the thousands who came to see Jesus heal lepers, open blind eyes, and raise the dead, only hundreds came to hear him teach. And out of the hundreds who heard him teach, only 70 would actually follow him. We see this in Luke 10, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. Of the 70 who followed him, only 12 left everything. Of the 12 who left everything, only three went with him to the Mount of Transfiguration and prayed with him in Gethsemane. And of those three, only one was at the cross. John, he lacked love, but he had loyalty. And perhaps that's why, from the cross, Jesus looked down to this loyal one and commended his mother into John's care. You look at that. John was the one. John was the one that was with him the entirety of that process. John was the one who rested his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. John was the one, the only one, at the cross that day. John was the one that Jesus said, look at your mother, look at your son. That was John. And so this is who we're talking about. All, every single one, if you want to count Paul in this group too, all of the apostles were executed, all sentenced to death, John being one of them, but John survived and he still preached the gospel. They sent him to a prison island, he still preached the gospel. He received revelation, he still preached the gospel. And so the, the reigning Roman emperor said, who is this old man, get him out of here. And guess what he did? He still preached the gospel. And so Jesus called him home. How's that not incredible? <laughs> I just like this is just blows my mind that this is the man who we're about to read. This is the man um, that's worth reading about. So follow me, follow me, follow me. So last thing I'm going to say before we read, as I alluded to a minute ago, there are four gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew began with generation and genealogy of Jesus, going back to Abraham. So he starts at Abraham, shows lineage, children, son, 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 all the way from Joseph to Jesus. Mark began with the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. Luke began with Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. So we get the backstory of John the Baptist. And then his interaction with Jesus in the gospel starts. Now John, he begins at the beginning, the literal beginning, prior to Genesis beginning. And... Um, before time itself. And so we learn that Jesus existed even as the, the earth was nothing, God was, and God is. So let's read. From the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The man came for wit the camp. My goodness, I promise y'all, I can read. I teach literacy. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But, I have this verse highlighted, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God and to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. So we're going to, this is where we're going to exist today. I'm just going to isolate today's teaching between verses 1 through 12, and we're, that's 1 through 13, pardon me, and we're just going to kind of hover here and let the Lord do what he does today. We're not going to rush through the chapter just to get through it. Amen? All right. So let's start from the beginning. So the word was with God, and the word was God. Here, John, the first chapter, Jesus is scribe as a creator of all things. 
Paul, as he's writing to the Colossians concerning the preeminence of Jesus, declares that he is not only the creator, um, but he is the object of creation, and by him all things were made for him. So he is not only the creator, but the object of creation, and all things were made by him, the universe around us, and all this life forms. So we see Elohim. This is the in the, in the Hebrew or the Greek, I forget which is it, Pastor Nick. Is it, is it Greek or Hebrew Elohim? Hebrew. Hebrew. So in the Hebrew, it's Elohim, which is the plural for God, right? We see El Shaddai, El Roy. These are all singular references to God in the, in the Old Testament. El, singular form. Elohim is plural. This is, this is a nod to the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So when a lot of people speak, they speak, well, God, the God, the Father created this, that, and the other. They're not completely incorrect. When they say the Spirit hovered over the waters, well, the Holy Spirit created, they're not incorrect. When Jesus formed, oh, Jesus created, they're not incorrect because all three are God. And so when we say Elohim, it is the plural for all things, for he was God, he was with God, he was God. We're talking specifically about Jesus in that moment, but he was there in creation. So when we speak about Jesus Christ, God made flesh, our savior, our king, yes, we are talking about him in that sense in most of these gospel messages, but we have to understand, and this is why John started here. Jesus predates everything. Time is a creation of our God. He is timeless. So the question was asked to me at the school I work at. Well, one of the students asked me this question. Well, the beginning, I'm like, you're thinking linearly. God is. What does he say? I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am. And so when your mind starts to try to grasp on that, when you really try to start to wrap your mind about I am, I am eternal. He is. He just is. As, as sure as Jesus is with us in this room, Jesus is also with everybody around the world currently, which is crazy if you think about it, but also not only omnipresent just doesn't mean in right now time, omnipresent means throughout time. So just as sure as Jesus is with us here in this room, he is on the cross right now, he is also with the very last person drawing their last breath at the end times. Yeah. Currently, he is everywhere and everywhere. And when John, so this, this is why John starts here. He's like, I need you to understand who Jesus is. He's not just this guy that's on the cross claiming to be the Messiah. He is. He is so much greater than what that act was. And this is, this is why he starts here. And this is, again, why this is a great place to start for new believers. Because it really explains his lordship. His beautiful Elohim. Plural. And when it says was with God, it's having a conscious personal existence distinct of God as one that is from a, like saying, I am with him, I'm with her. So he is a person distinct of the creator, but also when it says was God having a conscious personal existence that is one that is with as well. So like he is separate, but a part of. So that sentence was formed purposely the phrasing of it was done on purpose to show you that jesus although he is jesus a separate entity he is part of so that is a very hard thing to explain to new believers that there is the father the son the holy spirit all are god the three are different aspects of god but they are all one but it is it is a great way again to introduce them to that concept which is beautiful and then we also see it again in Psalm 33, verses 6 through 9, where we read that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all of the earth fear the Lord, that all of the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples to no effect. That's a message within itself. How many of you have tried in your own strength time and time again to make something happen? How many of you have time and time again have tried and tried and tried and you have not gone to the Lord with it first? How many of you have seen those things happen and with all the energy and effort and blood, sweat and tears you've put into something? have tried 
and try and try and you've fallen flat on your face because you haven't invited the Lord into the situation. And so this is a great nod. Not only is he in control of all the things that we see and all of existence itself, everybody, he's in control of our timeline. He is in control of the path that he set before us. We just have to come into agreement with that path. And a lot of people find that notion oppressive. You mean my life isn't my own? You mean I'm not in control? You mean it's not me that got that job interview? It's not me that's making that paycheck? It's not me that did A, B, C, D, E, F, G? You mean somebody else is in charge of that? I don't like that idea. It's all about perspective. To me, that's free. <laughs> The fact that he has laid everything out, all I have to do is say, Lord, show me where you want me to go. Show me how to do this. And he's like, come on, let's go. I find that very free. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Mini message one, accomplished. <laughs> Colossians, verse one, 15 through 17 read, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created there in heaven, and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And I'm doing this on purpose as well. You will find that in this church, we always use the Bible to support the Bible, right? There's a beautiful image that I, I did not get, and then I'll, I'll see if I can find it, but I think it was Jordan Peterson or one of them had this beautiful graphic, and it was all, the, all, the, all 66 books in the Bible on a timeline, and it had like a different colored lines that show where like where this points to that, and that points to this, and this back to this, and there's this giant like multicolored rainbow of lines that just shows you how the Bible just supports itself. You don't need anything else. The Bible is good enough. It'll support itself. It'll demonstrate the truth of itself within itself. It's okay. It's been around for a while and it has yet to be proved in false. You're right? So he is consistent. He is before all things. And he is. He just is. And again, I already talked about Elohim. We see in the Old Testament, the father El, singular, El Elyon, God most high, El Roy, God who sees, El Shaddai, all sufficient one. So El, when we see that in the Old Testament, El, a singular version of God, the Father, is what it's referring to there. Verses four and five speaks, in him was life, and life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So in him was life. He, Jesus, is thus the living word. Or as John later calls him in his epistles, the word of life. And the light of men, so true light is this, and this applies to women too, but just speaking in the context of the Bible, the light of men, knowledge, integrity, intelligence, and subjection to God. Knowledge, integrity, intelligence, and subjection to God. This is what it means to live in the light of the Lord. And so that's what John is pointing to. And what does light have to do with darkness? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. If we shut all the lights off in this auditorium right now, close those doors, it would be dark in there, yes? The minute we flipped on one light, what happens? The darkness flees. The darkness has nothing to do with the light and vice versa. Jesus came to be the light of the world and they crucified him for it. We, Christians, that term historically was meant to be an insult. Many Christs, Christians, oh, you Christians, you Christians. And we're like, I love it. We're going to take it. There's a gentleman at the Victory House that I love a lot. He was out preaching the word one day on the streets. And he says, oh, you're one of those Bible thumping Jesus freaks. He's like, that's the best compliment I've heard all day. Right? It's wonderful. So what does I have to do with darkness? Nothing. We shine in the darkness. The shadow of death over mankind in this fallen world, that is the darkness. There is dark, this is a fallen world. Look at society. I'm not gonna get political, I'm not gonna get all, I'm not gonna go into all the areas that I could go to that I think all of you know where I could go. But this is a fallen world. 
In Revelation, they will call good evil and evil good. The things that we raise up in society, the things that we put on a platform and a pedestal, the things that are celebrated and rejoiced, that are encouraged, is evidence to the truth of this message, to the truth of the gospel, the darkness of the world. We are the light of the world now. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he reigns and rules in our heart. We are to be the carriers of this light in this dark place to preach it boldly. We're not used car salesmen and women. We're not selling something that isn't true. We're not selling something that's detrimental to people. We are selling nothing. We are testifying to the goodness of God. We are testifying to the truth of his sacrifice. We are testifying to the eternal glory that awaits all who humble themselves and give their lives to Christ. Amen. We are not salespeople. We are representatives in a dark place. And the Greek word translated for comprehend can mean either extinguish or understand. You all know me. I'm a literacy teacher. I'm all about words. Right? And so when I look this up, comprehend in the Greek means both extinguish, understand. So both work because darkness can accomplish neither. Darkness can neither understand the light of the Lord, and darkness can never extinguish the light of the Lord. One light would fill this whole room with light. This vast square footage of darkness would run with one light. That's the power, a small symbolic image of the power that lies within each of us. We just have to come into agreement with it. He's already given it to you. You just have to understand that you're worthy of it. You're worthy of it. And to go back, I pray that it never happens, but to go back, these apostles gave everything. Everything. Did they receive any sort of monetary benefit from preaching the gospel? No, they were broke. Were they welcomed as heroes in every town they went into? Nope, they were beaten, imprisoned, and kicked out of town most of the times. Did they have any sort of housing or real estate? No. Did they have a, a, an abundance of food and money? No. They gave it everything because they knew the light that they carried and what was awaiting them, the truth and the promise of Jesus Christ, the man whom they walked with, except for Paul. Paul met him later on his road to Damascus, but this was worth everything. They feared nothing. I'm sure none of them woke up every morning and was like, you know what? Today's a great day to die. I'm cool with it. No. Absolutely not. But they would not let that fear change what Jesus did to them. Carry that light. Be bold in a dark place. It's the truth. How many people do you know would stand up for the truth? And how many do you know that would die for a lie? The answer is pretty simple. Amen? Yeah. All right. Rock and roll. Verses 6 through 10. It said, there was a man sent from God. This is John the Baptist. I know it gets confusing because we have John and John. But this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He, John the Baptist, was not that light because the light was who? <laughs> Jesus. Hey, hey all right. Um, that was true light, which gives light to every man. Now, John the Baptist, John the Baptist, John the Baptist, John the Baptist. He was what I would consider, this is not biblical, this is me as a human being, as a man. John the Baptist is what I would consider the first influencer, right? Like we live in a society where influencers, influencers, social media, like do what I do, say what I say, buy what I want to sell, right? Influence, influence, influence. John the Baptist historically was called, if you ever watched The Chosen, they called him Crazy John. Like he's the guy out in the forest, crazy hair, camel, eating locusts, you know, camel fur outfits, eating locusts and doing all kinds of crazy things. But he wasn't crazy. He knew, he was filled with the spirit. He knew who was to come. And he was out there minding his own business, so to speak, but preaching repentance, preaching the baptism, right? He was to prepare the way for our Savior. And so when you look at him, you look at what influencer means today. Again, English teacher, 
In influence in today's society is defined as the act or power of producing an effect without an apparent exertion or force of direct exercise of command. Put it plainly, somebody who can accomplish things without any effort. I'm going to get something done without really super trying. That's what an influencer is. And I looked at this word. It is a nine letter word. First two letters of influence are I and N. The middle letter, the fifth letter, is the letter U. In you. Influences, they're in us. Right? They're in you, they're in me. We are influenced constantly. We are influenced by our environment. We're influenced by our family. We're influenced by the culture of the world. We're influenced by our entertainment. There are so many things that influence our character, that influence what we say, what we do, how we think, how we dress. Right? We have to understand, just like John understood, and guess what they called him, everybody? They called him crazy. How many people, it's rhetorical, don't raise your hands, don't shout out, it's not that time, but how many people, when you guys started going, going towards Christ, when you started to change things, when you started to make moves, and you started to submit your life to Jesus, how many people looked at you that knew you, the old you, were like, dude, you're, what's going on with you? You know, it's crazy. It's crazy. Are you a part of a cult? <laughs> no. Right? There's a very cool um, picture a friend of mine shared on Facebook, of all places. I read it. I saw it yesterday, I believe. And it was this one single comic, uh, of, like a far side comic. And it was, it's, it's, he said, I apologize for the vulgarity of this picture. It's not very vulgar. But it's, it's just, it's just a swimming pool. And there's like seven kids in a circle around one kid in the middle, but the whole pool was yellow. Okay? And the one kid in the middle that was getting teased, he was in clear water. So the image, for those that don't get it, is like you were, you know, they're teasing the kid, like historically the one kid that pees in the pool, the pool is clear, but they pee in it. But, but the kid in the middle is a representative of Christ in a fallen world, in a dirty, dark world. So he's surrounded by all this vile nastiness, but he is exuding life. He is exuding the word and the gospel. So how many of us are called crazy like John? I don't know. And I pray that doesn't happen. But that should not make you waver from telling the truth. The truth sometimes is hard to hear and people will kick back kick back but don't take that personally it's not you that they're fighting against it's what their spirit is receiving because they know deep down that what you're saying is right what you're saying is true and it's their spirit that fights back don't judge them love them through it hold them accountable but love them through it our environment our cities our neighborhoods our jobs our schools Right? The or I'm like I'm from Miami. Like, oh you're from Miami. It's like, oh like no, I'm just from Miami, bro. That's just where I was born. Right? Yes, I love the dolphins. I love the heat. Come on. But that doesn't that's not who I am. That's where I'm from. Right? Our entertainment, TV, music, social media, again, sports teams. A lot of people are influenced by these things. Um, I, the old me, I used to worship the idol of sports. Like everything I was, I still love sports today, but God comes first, my wife comes second, my children come third. We talked about that once, we'll get there another day maybe. But I can still enjoy sports from a different place in my life. But there were so many times, to go back to my point, there were so many times before I knew the Lord, and before I worshiped the idol of sports, that my mood, my demeanor would be affected by the success or failures of the teams that I idolize. <laughs> right? I'd be in a bad mood. And I let a game. <laughs> it's stupid if you think about it. I let a game affect how I spoke to my wife. Affect how I how I engaged I was with my children. Lord, I'm sorry. Let our friends influence us. 
And again, one of the things that I had to do, this is not a, a, a roadmap for you and your salvation. When the Lord started getting my attention, I had to evaluate my circle of friends. And I love my friends. To this day, I love them. These are brothers that have been through thick and thin with me. Thick and thin. But I had to take a step back. And I had to adjust their influence in my life. And I had to put them at a distance. Mm -hmm. And again, there's an, there's an unfollow and an unfriend for a reason on Facebook, right? You can unfollow somebody and still be connected to them because you never know when that, that, that opportunity, that Kairos moment may come when you can preach the gospel into their lives. And so we have to approach our friendships like that as well. We don't necessarily have to delete a friendship. No matter how far in their sin they are, I, again, this is me as a human being, as a man, as a pastor, I personally believe that cutting people off isn't always the best move. I mean, there might be one or two people that the Lord may say, it's time for that one to go. And I don't knock what God does. But I feel like in our own personal relationships, it's okay to unfollow. You see, understand what I'm getting at? Take a step back. Watch how they influence you. Watch what they speak over you. Watch what they say to you. Watch what they're leading you to do. I talked about Pastor Nick a second ago. He is my pastor. He is my spiritual father. He is also one of my best friends. And the world has a saying, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. He loved me enough. This is one of three books, by the way. <laughs> Yay! But this is who I surround myself with now. He is an influence in my life. Because we're like-minded in our goal, we want to see God reign and rule. You may have to evaluate your friends and our family. Our family, our family, our family. This is something that Lindsay and I are, are always aware of and consistently trying to navigate where we are with the Lord and everything. And it's often the most challenging to be a certain way when you are raised a certain way in a culture that's a certain way. And you still, obviously, I love, we love our family. But at the same time, we're different now. We're different. And praise God they've accepted that. It's taken some time. And they're still learning. But to take it off of me, our culture, our family history, it's all secondary. It's all secondary to who we are in Christ. Our last name. Oh, you're a Burnside. I am. My children are Burnsides. But more importantly than that, they are children of the Most High. You have to know that. Your faith becomes... Pardon me. Your faith comes before your last name. Oh, but your blood, your blood. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit gave me this this morning. Your blood is secondary to the blood that was bled out for you on the cross. His blood. His blood. Oh, but your blood. No, but his. But his. Amen. And just to go back one second, I said, show me your friends. I'll show you who you'll be. We see this again biblically in Proverbs 13, 20. It says, walk with the wise and become wise. Walk with fools and get in trouble. <laughs> That's the NLT version. I, I took that one on purpose. I was like, walk with fools and get in trouble. Lord, if you only would have shown me that when I was 15, man, things would have been so much different. No, it wouldn't have. I was a knucklehead. Um, <laughs> Verse 7 specifically, I highlighted this for a reason. Let's look at it. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. And we're not called. This is good. This is why the Lord gave it to us. <laughs> Last thing. We are not called to debate. We are not called to argue. Okay. We're not here to convince anyone of anything. We are called to be witnesses, again, to share the truth. We are to have conversations, testimonies, speaking in love, 
the minute things turn heated, the minute things get emotionally charged, voices start amplifying, it starts turning personal, please, you are ambassadors of Christ. You are representatives of Jesus. Shut it down. Shut it down. Whoever needs to hear this, because I used to be one of them, so I'm speaking from a place of being repentant of this myself, it is not our job to convince anybody on social media why their stance on A, B, and C is wrong. <laughs> or not to get into back and forth with people uh, on the street or on social media or here, there, A, B, C, everywhere. We are not to do that. If people want to have a legitimate conversation about the gospel, engage, engage, engage. But if people come at you with this energy, with this, oh, da, 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 and you can, you, your discernment will kick in right away, like your spider senses. You will see it coming from a mile away. Don't do it. Don't do it. And John was met with this. This is why I say this. Crazy John in the woods doing this and that. And they, I mean, they, you brood of vipers, he said to the Pharisees that came. They were there to judge him and say things and talk about him and this, this, and this. But guess what he did? Kept right on going. Kept right on moving. And people received, people were baptized, and then Jesus came. And everything changed. So there you go. Verses 10 through 12. And he was in the world, Jesus, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but God. Isn't it interesting that those who were possessed by evil spirits, historically in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, cried out, we know who you are. Think of Legion. Jesus shows up. What do you have to do with me, son of God? They knew him. Evidently, the winds and the waves knew who he was. <laughs> For even he was standing at the little ship and was about to sink when he spoke, the wind and the waves said, and when the wind and the waves followed when he said, peace, be still. They obeyed his voice. They knew who he was. The rocks evidently knew who he was because when the Pharisees were encouraging him, to rebuke his disciples on the day of his triumphant entry, he said, I say unto you that if these things should hold their peace, these very stones would immediately cry out. They knew who he was. But it was only darkened minds of man that failed to recognize him. Spirits were moving. People knew. People that were, were either under the influence of the enemy or people that knew the gospel knew they sensed by the spirit who jesus was and we see here in the gospel he was in the world and the world was made through him but the world did not know him the clouded minds of men the deceived what, what do deceived people have in common they're deceived they don't know they're deceived right when he came to proclaim his godship who he is he was rejected and so this is what john is speaking of now like he came People didn't comprehend it. The darkness could not comprehend what they were seeing. He did not fit the mold of what, of what the Pharisees thought were being, was being prophesied about the Messiah, and they rejected him. But even the evil spirits knew who he was. I'm almost done, so I'm gonna go ahead and invite the worship team on back up. His own did not receive him. Think of how that must feel to look to our creator. We stand, we cheer, we celebrate at concerts. We, we sing along, we, 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 we praise and we idolize and we wear, again, go back to sports, we wear jerseys and we, we stand and cheer and for athletics and we, we do all this praising and worship in his presence. Yet, when we come and we talk about Jesus, the world's reaction typically is to sit and be still. Hold our hands and be silent. How that must look. How that must feel. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, the angel of the Lord said to Mary in Luke 1 31. The name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. You will receive power to become a son or a daughter of God, 
when you believe that Jesus is not merely a Savior or even the Savior, but He is your Savior. Your Savior. So here He is, in the beginning with God, the Creator of all things, coming to His creation and not being recognized, not being, appre not being apprehended, coming into His own, not being received, and yet as many as would receive Him. And so the gospel of grace, as many as would receive Him to them, He gave the power to become the sons of God and daughters of God. The Son of God becoming man in order that he might reach each of us, sons and daughters, who would believe in his name. Amen. This is the beginning of the Gospel of John.